Okay, um, next I'd like to look at what's called the Einstein triangle relationship. And what this is going to do is connect in, in the last example, we looked at a way of saying total energy is equal to kinetic energy plus rest energy. <coughs> Uh, and so that related total energy to kinetic energy. What I'd like to do here, I could call this E. So we see there that this really is the same thing as saying E equals mc squared, because this is our true mass times the speed of light squared. Okay. But there's another equivalent way of writing the total energy, and that's in terms of the relativistic momentum. And sometimes we're more interested in calculating the relativistic momentum than we are, uh, or and re relating that to the total energy. And so what I'd like to do here is just take, and let's look at this term. P squared C squared minus M naught squared C to the fourth. Let's just look at that and see what that um, Plus, sorry, plus m naught squared c to the fourth. Let's just look at, at what this ends up being from what we already know in terms of our relativistic momentum. So p squared is going to be m naught squared v squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. So that's p squared here times c squared okay, plus m naught squared c to the fourth. Okay, and uh, so what I want to do next with this is to find a lowest common denominator for m naught squared c to the fourth. Okay, and so what I can do then is multiply numerator and denominator minus v squared over c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. So now I can get both of these terms under the same uh, denominator. Okay, and uh, so uh, if I do that here, then this first term is going to be m naught squared v squared c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared plus m naught squared c to the fourth divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared plus this last term is going to be um, m naught squared v squared c squared. Okay, because I got here m naught squared c to the fourth, and so then one of the two factors of the c squared are going to cancel, so that's going to give me here m naught squared v squared, and then this term, sorry, should be negative. <coughs> okay, and so what we see then is that because these are under the same denominator, these two terms cancel. So this gives me m naught squared c to the fourth divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. But what is that? That's just m naught c squared divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared quantity squared. Or that's just e squared our total energy squared. Okay, so we started out then, and the reason why I started out this way is that I knew that was going to end up being E squared, but I just wanted to show that it is. Okay, so by working this thing through with our definition for relativistic momentum, multiplying that by the speed of light squared, then taking the square of the rest energy, finding the lowest common denominator, I was able to show that that's equal to E squared. So an alternative form for our relativistic 
energy relationship is to write it as E squared equals P squared C squared plus M naught C squared quantity squared. <coughs> and so this is called the Einstein triangle relationship. We can look at it up on the data projector. <coughs> and we can see that the energy kind of looks like a Pythagorean sum of PC, momentum times the speed of light, and the rest energy, m naught c squared. Now, we want to be careful with these kinds of depictions uh, and calling it the Einstein triangle because this makes it appear as though energy is a vector having components of rest energy and PC. But that's not the case here. This just happens to be a convenient way of expressing the total energy, but we should remember that that total energy is a scalar. Okay, so we have our choice then of two different ways to express the total energy. We can either express it in terms of the relativistic kinetic energy or in terms of the relativistic momentum. Now in particular, there is kind of an interesting uh, special case, which we'll look at in more detail in chapter 38. Uh, this is the photon. But a photon, which is a particle of the electromagnetic force, uh, and can also be thought of as being an electromagnetic wave, uh, has zero rest mass. And so m naught is equal to zero. Remember that it always travels at the speed of light. So if that's the case then, for a photon, our einstein triangle relationship still works, but with one of the sides of the triangle being equal to zero. So E is equal to PC. Okay, and so that means then that the momentum, P of a photon, is not equal to zero, even though the photon has zero mass, zero rest mass. And it still has momentum. It, because it has, a, a, in essence, an energy equivalence associated with it. So the en uh, it's equal to the energy of the photon divided by the speed of light. And so that's going to be a result that we'll look at later. Now, a couple other things regarding E equals mc squared. This is a equivalence then between mass and energy. So E equals mc squared is a way of stating that there is an equivalent amount of energy in any given amount of mass. So in other words, if we have a, a certain quantity of mass, might be the mass of this eraser, for example, there might be a way of turning that completely into energy. And there is an energy equivalence to this, such that if we had the right mechanism for doing it, we could turn this mass into energy. Or, in the case of the Big Bang, it worked in reverse. For the first second after the Big Bang, it was the energy from the fireball of the Big Bang that's being converted into mass. Okay, and so you can think of mass as being in either direction, whether mass is being converted into energy, and that's mostly what happens in the universe of today, or whether in the first second after the Big Bang, energy was being converted into mass. You say that there is an equivalence between them so that they can turn into each other under the appropriate conditions. Okay, and so let's say that we have uh, uh, 
the next example, let's say that we have a uh, <clears throat> an intensity problem with sunlight. Let's say that the intensity of sunlight uh, at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, I could say at the Earth's surface, but we have to correct for the fact that some of that light is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere on its way in. So the intensity of the sunlight uh, corrected for atmospheric interference is about 1,000 watts per meter squared. Okay, so that's an intensity. Now you may recall from Physics 208b that intensity is power per unit area. Okay, so when we say intensity, that's what we mean, power per area. So that's the intensity of energy per unit time per unit area. That's what we mean by intensity. Okay, and uh, so from this information then, and also from the fact that the distance from the Earth to the Sun is 150 million kilometers or that's 93 million miles on the average. There's a 2% variation there, but it averages to 93 million miles. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is that far. Let's find the amount of mass that's being turned into energy in the Sun every second. talked about an energy mechanism for what powers the sun. Is it trolls, spiders, uh, large coal furnaces? No, it's nuclear fusion. And so in a nuclear fusion reaction, which we'll talk about much more later, we have four hydrogen atoms turn into helium plus energy. But what we find is if we weigh the four hydrogen atoms before the reaction takes place and compare that to the weight of the helium atom after the reaction takes place, this side of the scale drops down and this side of the scale pops up. Okay? And so that means the helium is lighter than the four hydrogen. And the energy is the mass difference between the four hydrogen and the helium. So literally then, the conversion of hydrogen into helium puts the nucleons in a more stable, lower energy state so that the helium atom can release energy. But it's lost mass in the process of doing that. Okay? And so what we're trying to calculate here is how much mass, how much lighter does the sun get every second? because of the conversion of mass and energy that powers the sun. Okay, so let's go over to this board and see if we can figure this out. Well, 1,000 watts per square meter to get the intensity turned into a power output of the sun
that's going to equal the intensity of light at the Earth's surface times the surface area of a sphere that has a radius that's equal to 93 million miles. Remember that intensity is power per area. So we have power per area times area. So this is the area of a sphere with the Earth's radius. Okay, so let's draw a picture. Here's the sun. Imagine it like a big light bulb. Then all of the energy is coming out spherically symmetric like this in all directions, but it's spreading out. So by the time that we get to the Earth, the Earth is only getting a little bit of that energy associated with a small amount of um, <clears throat> surface that uh, the sun can shine the energy through. And the energy is leaking out in all these other directions too. So, we're talking about then 4 pi r squared is going to be this area. Now we know it's 4 pi r squared and not 4 thirds pi r cubed, which I see over and over again as a mistake that's made. Don't fall into that. You know that area has units of square meters, so it's got to be an r squared term. Volume has units of r cubed, so the 4 thirds pi r cubed has to be a volume, right? So don't get those mixed up. Just think about the units, and you'll be able to keep that straight. All right, so now we can write then the uh, intensity is 1,000 watts per meter squared times 4 pi times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that's 150 times 10 to the uh, 6 kilometers. Okay, so the radius then, r, is going to be 150 times 10 to the 9 meters. Squared. Like that. <clears throat> and so that's going to be 1,000 watts per meter squared. And then here we'll have 4 pi times 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters squared. <clears throat> and so that's going to be the power output of the sun. Okay, so let's punch that number out. It's going to be a lot of watts. But I think you can expect that it'll be a lot of watts. If the sun is as bright as it is, if we can burn out our eyes at 93 million miles away, then it must be really, really bright. Here we've got 1.5. Square that. That gives us 2.82 times 10 to the 26. equal to 2.82 times 10 to the 26 joules per second. So that means that each second the sun puts out that amount of energy. that energy come from? It comes from mass. It comes from the difference in mass between the hydrogen atoms and the helium atom. So how much of a difference is this? Well, this turns out to be about 1% lighter. So you might wonder then, well, how much, how efficient can that be if it's only like, it's actually 0.7% if you're, you're really accurate about it. 
that it's less than 1% efficient. And yet it's the energy that powers the sun. How can we, how can we see that that must be true? Well, remember that a little tiny bit of mass can produce a huge amount of energy because it's E equals mc squared. Okay, so your mass in is multiplied by a big number, the speed of light, multiplied by itself. <coughs> so that's like 9 times 10 to the 16th power is the speed of light squared. That's a number you'll get used to. 3 times 10 to the 8th squared, 9 times 10 to the 16th. And so that's how much energy we get. So if I took, just to put this in perspective, I took this little pin here, and I could convert it completely to energy. Uh, I'd have enough uh, explosive force, I could blow up Cuesta College halfway to Morro Bay in San Luis Obispo, just turn it into a big crater, just with this amount of mass. If we took the mass of a typical student in the class and converted that completely to energy, we could blow up most of California with that. Okay? And so, that shows us how concentrated mass is in terms of its energy equivalence. Right? And so here, even though only 1% of the mass of the hydrogen is converted into helium, that's still plenty to power the sun because of E equals mc squared. Okay? That little bit of mass can still produce a huge amount of energy. But let's see how much mass this is. And maybe it's not so little. Okay, so the sun produces this amount of joules every second. So our question is, what's the mass turned to energy each second inside the sun? So we can say then that that mass turned to energy is delta m. That's the mass loss by the sun. Only 1% of the total amount of hydrogen that's being converted into helium c squared equals the energy in one second. Okay, so that means that delta m, the mass that is being um, consumed inside of the sun, is e over c squared, but this is the energy in one second, so that's going to be 2 0.82 times 10 to the 26 joules every second divided by 9 times 10 to the 16 meters squared per second squared. And so that's actually going to be a pretty big number. times 10 to the 9 kilograms. Each second. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, if we wanted to convert that roughly into to pounds, we could divide this by, what, 2,000? kilogram, 2.2 pounds, so it's about a thousand. So this would be something like three billion tons of mass per second. Very roughly. <clears throat> billion tons! tons of mass per second. So if this is 1% efficient, that means there's something like 300 million tons of hydrogen being turned into helium every second inside of the sun. And uh, so this number is a little more accurate. This one I, I converted to uh, uh, tons and 
I didn't say whether it was regular 2,000 pounds or metric ton, but uh, it's something like a few million tons of mass uh, converted into energy every second. So you might think then, well, the sun must be running out of mass pretty quickly then, and then if it's using 100 times that much hydrogen, or something like a few hundred million tons a second of hydrogen are being converted into helium, how long can it last? And the answer is about 12 billion years total, of which maybe four and a half billion is over. So it's something like a third to halfway used up. And, uh, but if you work this out in terms of the mass of the sun, the mass of the sun is on the order of 10 to the 31 kilograms. Okay, so this is 10 to the 9. So even if you multiply this, well, the number of seconds in a year is about 10 to the 7. And so then in a billion years, that would be 9, 7, 16, about 10 to the 16th power seconds. Okay, so we have kilograms times seconds times 10 to the 16, 10 to the 9, that would be like 10 to the 25. Okay, so 10 to the 25 versus 10 to the 31 is one part in a million. So even over a billion years, you, the sun is only losing one part in uh, a million or so, something like that of its mass. And so it's not even hardly going to.